Okay, I am so incredibly excited to have Dr. Tom Walters joining me today. Uh, Dr. Walters has been a professor. He is now a published author, as well as ro- runs a social media account that has a very big following, and he has been able to impact millions of people. And I can't tell you how exciting I, I am to have you here. Uh, so welcome. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks, man. Thanks for the opportunity we were talking about before jumping on. I uh, just totally nerd out on uh, pain and injury and rehab and movement, fitness, all that stuff. So always excited to have an opportunity to talk about these topics. So thank you. <laughs> For sure. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to digging into that. But I know there's a lot to share. It. Uh, we're going to get into it and really have a session today. But you know, let's, let's take a step back and can you kind of paint a vivid picture of your evolution in the field of physical therapy? Like what inspired you on this path? And were there any twists and turns that have gotten you to where you are now? Yeah, I think I was uh, inspired. Uh, not, I didn't know right away. I wasn't one of those people like in high school that knew I was going to be a PT. My wife was like that. She's a PT. She just yeah. knew probably from like middle school that she was going to go this direction. But I uh, was really a uh, athlete in high school. Like I was a martial artist at a black belt in Taekwondo. I taught Taekwondo. I did judo. I was a gymnast. I kind of did all these things together and I was super serious. Martial arts was really my identity. I was Mr. Walters for like lots of years. And I thought I would open a Taekwondo school. That was my plan after high school was just to go into martial arts and open schools. And I think uh, when I reflect back on that, I loved education. I loved teaching. And and so that's really where I'm at today. That's like probably the theme that's been consistent in anything I've been in. I really just like to learn about things. I like to tell other people about them. And so I, uh, in high school, had knee surgery. I had a bipartite patella in my left knee. Uh, so just my kneecap was in two pieces. It was just congenitally formed that way. And it's just a small piece, but I had to have it taken out. It was close to my patellar tendon. Every time I'd land from jumping, it would hurt and uh, my knee would kind of buckle. So just from pain. So they uh, took that piece out and then it was back in, back in those days, you know, I'm old now, but that was 1996 and they put me in a straight knee immobilizer and uh, for six weeks. So I developed a big contracture. I couldn't flex my knee past 90 degrees. Of course, my quad was so atrophied. I mean, it, my knee looked like a volleyball because I had no thigh mass, no muscle mass left. But uh, I ended up going to PT um, because of all the, the weakness and the joint mobility issue. And that was really my first exposure to it. My parents are both in kind of like social service kind of fields. My dad was a social worker. And my mom was a, is a psychiatric nurse. And so I had some exposure to different fields. And I, so I, we had family friends that were PTs, but I hadn't really thought of it as a career in uh, college. I took anatomy and physiology and that really, I became kind of obsessed with that material. I didn't, I wasn't exposed to it in high school. In high school, I really only thought about exercise as a performance thing. Like I just thought I was really, I'd always read muscle and fitness. I was like really into how can I lift weights or do these exercises to make my body look different or improve my performance. And, and I was an exercise science major in undergrad and but that was really kind of my first exposure. I started learning about different fields and thinking about exercise to treat pain and injuries. And I looked at a lot of different things, medical school, optometry, podiatry, all kind of in health and medical fields, but ultimately physical therapy, because I was so passionate about the musculoskeletal system and exercise, it was the most natural kind of career for me to go into besides just, you know, I was a trainer at the time. And so I could have stayed in that area. But I think at that age, I thought I will have more stability if I get a degree in an occupation that there's a need for and is always going to be around. So that was kind of my logic at the time. And then since being a PT, I, I went into PT school always with the plan of being in orthopedics and sports medicine. I was really into biomechanics. I really liked thinking about convex concave rules and how are the architecture of our joints and how they move and these different and, and just orthopedics in general. And it fit, as you know, it fits really well with like that exercise science background. Like you're using therapeutic exercise so often to address parts of the musculoskeletal system. And so I was kind of always going to be, my plan was always to be in that area. I started, I was only in an insurance-based clinic for two years and just realized it was not going to be the best fit. You know, not getting enough time with people, being able to provide quality care. It just was burning me out. So I knew I wanted to get back to education in some way and then went uh, into teaching. So for nine years, I taught undergraduate kinesiology at a college here and I'm in Santa Barbara, California. I taught biomechanics, pain science, therapeutic exercise, and then, you know, sometimes the other various courses. But so I was really full time teaching. And also seeing patients kind of on the side, almost, clinical work was almost kind of like my side hustle. I just was doing a little bit of it to kind of stay in the game. And uh, yeah, that um, 
I left that job in the spring of 2019 um, because I had started my work on social media, which was just a hobby when I started it in 2016. And then as that grew, I decided that rather than pursue a tenure track position in teaching, there's a lot of stress, there's stressors that go along with that, like it getting tenure. And I, even though I loved education, I just didn't know if that was the right fit. And with the social media accounts growing, I thought I can do education online and just build my own business. So that's been kind of, there's been a bunch of other things there. I worked for Cirque du Soleil for a while. I uh, did five years of a doctorate of science at Texas Tech in rehabilitation science, um, it, thinking I would stay in that tenure track position. But I've been all over. Uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy and kind of impulsive. I did traveling PT for a year. I just, I like change and stimulation. And unfortunately, sometimes I'm a little impulsive. I'm getting better, but anyways, yeah, that's kind of you're, the journey. You're you're talking to someone that thinks very similarly to you, you know, someone that's worked as a travel PT for five years myself. Like if we, with change, as we know, like change stimulates neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and just optimizes neuroplasticity, right? And it allows us to grow. And I love meeting people like you that crave that kind of stuff. Like they're like, what's next? How do I challenge myself? And I didn't realize how diverse your background was with that. So wait, you went and did five years, your doctorate in science, but you didn't finish it? Yeah, I left in the dissertation. I'm a statistic at this point. <laughs> I, my dissertation was all written. I just, I was, a, I had the methods done. I was just about ready to go to Texas. I was at Texas Tech to go collect data. And then I decided I was really only doing that degree because colleges and universities don't accept clinical doctorates and PT for mm. tenure. So I had to get an academic doctorate, like a PhD or an EDD. This was a doctor of science. And I, so I was only doing it to stay in that tenure track position. And then I decided... I just didn't want to wow. do more. Well, good so, thing you found, good thing you yeah. found an outlet with social, right? And you know, real life. Big time. I'm super grateful <laughs> for it. Yeah, honestly, no, I'm super grateful for the platforms and because I really do love education and so to be able to stay in it is for amazing. Sure. For sure. So, I mean, when it, when it comes down to it, what you educate on is movement-based things, right? And I think like people talk a lot about, you know, fitness, they talk about m mental health, Let's talk about just like, let's focus on in movement specifically, right? You know, and let's, can you kind of explain the power of movement health and why someone should be making that a priority in their life? Man, I, it is so hard to, I feel like I'm so deep in that. Sometimes stepping back and trying to cover that from a zoomed out level can be so hard because you and I know how powerful there's so many important things about movement. But I think, man, it goes from everything to, you know, when we think about movement health, obviously most people, most physical therapists, most people interact with us are going to think about, you know, their muscles and tendons and joints, the things that physical therapists are typically addressing. And obviously movement health is so important for keeping your physical body healthy, keeping your muscles strong, keeping your tendons strong, keeping your cartilage healthy in your knees and hips. You know, it's, it is so important for keeping that musculoskeletal system, that physical body healthy so that you can do the things in daily life that you like to do easily. Like that, so many times I think that's the goal for me. I'm 41 now and, you know, just having a body that I can move through full range of motion, I have good mobility with, I have strength through full range of motion that allows me to do all of my daily tasks without thinking about them. Because you see people where it's a struggle to go up and down stairs or to get up off the ground. And I don't want to be, it's so important to take care of your movement system so that you can keep doing your basic daily tasks and the things you enjoy easily. So I think that's a huge part, like you talked about before exercise and the physical body is totally intertwined with your brain and mental health. And so we have lots of studies showing that aerobic exercise and resistance training change your brain, right? They, they enhance neuroplasticity. They encourage this neurogenesis process where you're growing new neurons. There are so many studies now on exercise and movement, taking care of your movement system and its effects on mental health, whether it's anxiety, depression, you know, stress management. And I think just longevity, like nobody most of us want to live as long as we can and have in those years be as healthy as we can. And I think so many of the things we do in physical therapy are not just about, of course, you're using them for rehab when you have pain and immediate pain or an injury, but they also are the things that keep your system healthy so that you have can live that longer life and be functional in those later years. You know, not just, not just live to be 95, but also be able to function really well all the way through those years. So I, I, to me, the movement system, I just think it's one of the, it should be one of your biggest priorities in your whole life to pay attention to and take care of. I, I totally agree with you. You know, 
when it comes down to it, you know, for me, I think I, I, I truly came to appreciate the power and the importance of movement health when I was working in hospitals. And I would go in and then I would see these people that were confined to a bed and then that's where they would be for the rest of their life, right? And it, it, it really took a toll on me physically and mentally seeing like, wow, just because you're living doesn't mean that there's any quality to your life. And when it comes down to it, the number one thing of where quality comes is movement, your ability to go and do those things. If you can't do them, all quality in your life is gone, right? For sure. And it's something that we're always like, oh, you know, I'll go exercise. I'll, you know, I'll go stretch. I'll go take that stuff. I'll do it later. But then we never get to it. And then these kind of things accumulate, right? Yep. Um, and gradually, and, and, and you gradually yeah. decline, right? Like you and I have both, I've worked in nursing homes too when I was doing travel PT. And I think you and I, when you work in those settings, you wake up to it. Like what ha- when your movement system declines, what can happen? You lose all that functional independence and you lose that quality of life. And I think in some ways I'm grateful to have that picture in the back of my head because it motivates me to keep my movement system healthy. I think like you said, so many people, they haven't seen that before. Maybe they've never had an older family member that's you know gotten sick or something or just gotten in their older years. Most people don't haven't really seen a whole lot of that. And so they, it's easy to just be sedentary, especially as you get older and you're at work and your life's busy, you might have a family, whatever. Like there's a lot going on and it makes it harder to set time aside to exercise. And I think if you're not aware of it, you know, your movement health, the health of your movement system will slowly decline. And you might not even realize it until you go to try to sprint or something and you get hurt or you, you tear your Achilles or your hamstring. You know, like people, it's not until they have a wake up call like that, they have an injury that they realize something's wrong with their system. And I think in so many cases, it's because of this gradual deconditioning that's happened because they aren't implementing the necessary steps to keep their movement system healthy. Absolutely. And, and I think that this is, and this is something we'll talk about later, but we'll talk about, so who's responsible in society to help combat that, right? And, you know, as physical therapists, we're typically on the recovery side after these issues have happened. But now you and I having a platform, we almost have a responsibility to educate people on these kind of things uh, so that they can understand like, hey, this is real life and we want you to be able to take action. Do not take your movement for granted so that you can avoid these. Things. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think that's a big part of why I do what I do because I feel like uh, most people like the, the traditional education system doesn't teach much about kinesiology unless you were the study of human movement, unless you were a kinesiology major, or some, you know, you don't really learn much of this. And it's such a disservice to people because you have this one body for your whole life. Like everyone should learn more about their movement system and how to keep it healthy. And just, about, I think just even like just different types of exercise, everyone should learn how to like go into a gym and perform, you know, or whatever at home. Like you should just learn how to move your body, how to control it. What are the different types of exercise? A brief overview of like, what are my different muscles and bones? And just, I just, yeah, I I really do feel a responsibility to help people understand those things. And I think even, you know, I've got two kids, I have two daughters who are 12 and nine. And I think I've felt even more of that responsibility as they've gotten older and just seeing that you just aren't exposed to that information really in school, you know, unless you are specifically choosing it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And that's where hopefully us as physical therapists can work with the fitness community as well to go away from a more fear-based approach to an empowering approach so that we can reach more people. Um, you know, and 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 so that comes into the next thing, right? Movement's all in good, but when it comes down to it, is that people don't want to move when they're in pain, right? And so it's like, well, it hurts to move, so I'm not gonna move. What do you tell someone when they're in pain with movement? Yeah, I think uh, I'm really trying to encourage people. I understand that logic. You know, a lot of people, the average person has that kind of idea like, oh, this hurts. I'm not going to move it. I'm going to kind of protect it. And sure, there's kind of a place for that, maybe for a really temporary period, maybe just for a couple of days. But really, we're trying to teach people about the importance of getting something moving through a pain-free range, you know, teaching people how to modify things like let's modify the range of motion or let's modify the load that's on this structure so that we can get it moving and and teaching them about the negative side effects that can happen if you totally immobilize something or stop it from moving. So, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about, oh, it hurts when I move this, they're thinking about just pure active range of motion. Like it hurts to my, I've got a shoulder injury and it hurts to 
lift my arm. Well, it's like, well, you can do other ways. There are other ways you can move your body that aren't active. We've got passive range of motion, active assisted range of motion. You can use different tools. So I think, you know, this is again, this is why physical therapists and coaches and trainers are helpful. We can teach people about different types of movement and how they can modify that movement to, you know, meet kind of where their system's at, where it's, where their symptoms are at, and then just gradually increase over time. But yeah, I'm always, I uh, am pretty much always looking to keep somebody on some sort of movement program and educate them on the importance of that. And then just modify and figure out how I need to change things or alter things based on their symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, I oftentimes am where I like holiday parties. And as soon as someone finds out that you're a PT, they want some some advice, right? And being like, oh, you know, my shoulder hurts or whatever hurts. And uh, and, they, and then they want you immediately to be like, what should I do, sure. right? <laughs> um, yeah. It's- and, and, and in that situation, what do you do when, when a family member comes up to you and does that? Man, I uh, there are definitely times where I'm like, I do not want to talk about PT stuff at this uh, get together. I have, um, I am probably a little bit unique and maybe you're similar in this way. Most cases, I actually would rather talk about that than some small talk other topic. So I actually really like teaching people about their movement system, about different injuries, and kind of and kind of counseling them on what they could do to move forward. I would much rather talk about that than oh, the weather was great today and blah blah blah. So in most cases, I actually am pretty open to it. I mean, there are sometimes, you know, again, I mean, there are cases sometimes where you just, you feel like, I don't know what it is. I think this happens. I have a number of doctor friends too, and I think this happens to them a lot too, but I think there's something, you know, because if I had a buddy who is a lawyer and accountant, I wouldn't go ask for free advice. I don't think, or maybe I wouldn't, I don't feel like people do that with some professions as easily as they do with like medical people. But Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's your body. And I think when it comes to health, people are really, I think they really want to get an answer. And if there's someone in a situation that might be able to help them, it is funny though, that people are just, they don't think through, this is this person's job and maybe I should like set up a consultation time and pay for their services. They just, I I just think sometimes the public doesn't understand and, but most of the time I'm pretty happy to talk about it. (laughs) Well, that's good. I I commend you for that. And I, I, I am, I, I would say I'm not similar in that sense because if I went and spent a day treating 15 patients, the last thing I want to do is give you advice on your, your things. And I don't mean that to be mean, but you know what I've started doing instead? And I, I kid you not, like I literally do this. <laughs> I love I tell it. them to get the book. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Man. Thank you. I appreciate it. So if, if you, if you, if you're listening to this, I'm basically holding Tom's book. And I wasn't planning on doing this transition, but I thought it was kind of a perfect opportunity. Um, I'm holding in front of the screen right there. Um, basically, it's called Rehab Science, How to Overcome Pain and Heal from Your Injury. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I recommend this to uh, not only like fitness and rehab professionals, but just everyday people, because this is like a Bible of injury recovery. And you know, in my mind can be used a lot for self-treatment, but I'm looking forward to learning more about your inspiration behind it. Uh, and, but first off, just congratulations for getting this thing published. Like I can only imagine how incredibly difficult that was. Thanks, man. Yeah. It was a journey. Two years, wrote it during COVID, uh, started in February, 2021. It basically took two years. It came out May of this year. And it was exactly, the goal was exactly what you were talking about there. It was to provide a sort of movement system resource for people. That was like a good looking copy table book. You know, it's 500 pages, like textbook size. So it's a big book, but it was really meant to help people understand all these things about pain and injury and then to give them programs that they could just implement on their own. Because we know that so many musculoskeletal conditions get better with just time alone. And then you can kind of speed that up if you introduce the right therapeutic exercises, you know, right? You kind of, you've got some things to kind of calm pain down. You've got some things to work on improving mobility, making sure you don't lose range of motion. And then some things to resistance training exercises to make the area more durable and resilient and, and, and reduce the likelihood that it comes back again. And so I really, I saw how powerful all these things were on social media, but Social media, it was, you just can't get into the nuance and the depth on a topic, right? It's like you have a certain word count you're allowed and uh, people have a hard time finding things. So I, my goal really was to like take all this stuff I'd learned 
in terms of interacting with people online over the last seven years and put it into one resource with references and and really to make it, we specifically wrote it with two populations in mind. And one was the everyday person who has no background in rehab or fitness or anything, and they can pick it up. It's written with language that the regular person can understand a ton of illustrations. You can almost just look at the illustrations and understand the material without reading it. And then mm-hmm. also the um, you know uh, medical movement fitness practitioner who wants a therapeutic exercise resource that has tons of research. So you can go to every body region has its own chapter. I could go to, like, say I've got a client who has a shoulder pain. I'm not really sure what to do about this. I can go to the shoulder chapter, read the material, like, okay, I could read the rotator cuff program. Oh, this sounds like what they're having. And then there's a program right there with three phases with pictures of me doing the exercises because a lot of the online content, like you could go find and read about conditions on like WebMD. But when you go to interventions, it'll just say physical therapy. It's not like there's a program there. So I think the book in a lot of ways, it was like we took a lot of the content you could get from a site like WebMD, but then also included a program as if you went to see a PT and they gave you one. So that was a goal, like a very, you know, a lot of science in the first 10 chapters, but then a lot of application in really the um, other 50% of the book with the programs. Why, Why do you think, you know, like why now? Why does the world need a book like this now? I think, uh, well... I think that the pandemic was an interesting time, which just sort of happened. You know, I was, I didn't know that was going to happen or, but writing that during the pandemic, I do think people reprioritize their health. And when you can't go see a practitioner, I think more people were curious about what can I do on my own, you know? And then, and I think that paired with, there's a, I just saw a big article come out on the shortage of PTs in the U S um, you know, Uh, The stat on there was that during COVID, 22% of the physical therapists left the industry and didn't come back. So there's a short, huge shortage of PTs. I know here where I live, there's an eight week wait to get into PT. And um, I just think, again, so many of these conditions get better with time and the right movements and exercises. Of course, a book can't do manual therapy. I can't work on you and massage and mobilize joints. But the things that have the best evidence are education and movement slash exercise and those things you can learn in a book. So Mm -hmm. I just think with the shortage of practitioners, how long it takes to get in and people being more interested in self-managing, taking care of their own body, it was another motivator to put something like this out. And I think that's why this book is a game changer, right? Because it now gives a very comprehensive yet digestible way to kind of view oh, okay, I'm experiencing X, Y, and Z. That sounds like potentially the pain that I'm having. Okay, here's some potential solutions that I can do without having to go through insurance authorization, waiting that eight weeks to get into a PT's office, right? And being like, okay, maybe some simple movement can help point me in the right direction. And I'm sure what ends up happening is people, they they start trying it out and they're like, oh, wow, starting to feel a little bit of reducing in pain, starting to relax a little bit, you know? And, And it's amazing what movement and time can do And this is where a vehicle like this, uh, you know, can be and allow for something. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. It just, uh, yeah, I think, you know, of course you have to do kind of your homework when you're doing it on your own. And that's why all that information is in the book. I sometimes, I know there's a lot of people that just come and jump into programs. I'm always hoping that once they see is something is kind of helping a little bit that they'll go back and do the homework and read some of the information in the first 10 chapters. And you have to also know how to, cause like, right. Well, I think some of the thing we do as rehab professionals, it's the most helpful to people is we know how to modify movements and exercise to match the person's symptoms. And if you're just going through a book and doing it, there might be, I included, you know, broke things into phases and included the movements and exercises that tend to help most people. But sometimes there might be one in there that the person, it hurts them when they do that. And we included lots of um, a chapters prior to the programs on kind of programming guidelines. So, you know, if you have to do your homework, kind of read those lots of questions. I'm like, okay, what if I have pain during a movement? What do I do? Or like, you've got to do your homework and kind of, it's great to have those programs, but you still have to realize you have to go in there and kind of personalize it and tailor it to yourself a little bit. Totally. And, and, and making people take control for their own, their own well being and their recovery being like, you know, if it hurts, stop doing it. Like if it's really painful, you need to be listening to your body yeah. As long as you listen to your body and then progress with graded exposure, like you're setting yourself up for success, exactly. right? Exactly. But, but you know, 
<clears throat> when it comes down to it, these are sure anyone can go and say, I have shoulder pain. Oh, here's some shoulder exercises. But behind an exercise pro, like behind an exercise protocol lies a carefully crafted design. And, you know, how did you select and design the exercises for this book for Rehab Science? That was actually probably the most fun of all this because I, I have a co author on this, Glenn Cordoza, awesome guy who's written a lot of um, sort of iconic books that I knew about. But I didn't always realize that Glenn was a part of it. Like some people know the Supple Leopard book from Kelly Starrett, um, Brett Contreras' his Glute Lab book. Glenn was the co-author on those books. And I just always knew the main author. But um, working with Glenn was actually a great process because I have a natural process that I do with patients when they come in. Like I have sort of a, a, a process I work through, but I had never really written it down. So there's something kind of amazing that comes from teaching your process to someone talking about it with them and writing it down, it actually, it really helped me better understand the process that I go through subconsciously with patients. And so it was, it was pretty neat to go through that and to create programs that are based on my process. And I think it's a process a lot of us just orthopedic PTs do naturally, which, you know, like I said, the programs are broken into three phases. Phase one is really a phase about calming down pain symptoms. So, right, we need to kind of do that in the beginning with people to get them to be able to move through greater range of motion and eventually to start putting more load on the system, making it stronger. So we need to calm the pain down initially. And so phase one is all about that strategies that help desensitize the system. A lot of it's kind of self-massage or self-mobilization techniques, almost like the manual therapy someone would do if I came in to see, if they came to see me, right? Because a lot of manual therapy, the goal of it a big chunk of the goal is to help reduce symptoms. And I think that's often where the manual therapy kind of, I always tell people it kind of jump starts the process. It gets the system calmed down a little bit so you can get into the movements and exercises. And I think the soft tissue mobilizations in phase one of the programs helps to do that. There are strategies you can implement on your own without a practitioner. Phase two is all about impairments because that's usually where we move after pain starts to reduce. We start looking at, well, what kind of mobility impairments do you have? What kind of motor control impairments do you have? And let's try and start correcting those. So people will find those types of exercises in phase two of the program, mobility exercises for the joint region that's involved, flexibility exercises, and then um, kind of lower load motor control exercises that sometimes look like a strength exercise, but it's like more focused on, can I control my kinetic chain and all my joints and maintain this particular alignment? Uh, that phase three is all resistance training. Any good physical therapy program should end with resistance. It should involve a lot of resistance training at the end, right? Like resistance training has such good evidence. People, resistance training is also mean strength training. It's just an external force. It could be body weight, bands, dumbbells, barbell, whatever it is. It's those things that you're adding load to your system. When you add load gradually with progressive overload, your tissues become stronger. And even though our body is much more complicated than like something like a car, it is very mechanical. That's why we have these that's why we have um, the study of biomechanics, things like this, like your muscles and tendons and ligaments and the discs in your spine and your bones all adapt and change when you put load on them gradually. So that's kind of idea. Like that was how they were crafted. Like I really thought through each condition and sat and envisioned what would I do if somebody came in with SI joint pain? Like what is it that I typically do? What's the order I go through? And that's how each program was designed. It's pretty cool how it was like a, it was really an introspective experience for you, um, you know, where you were going through and reflecting on it. Because as I was reading through the book, you know, I was thinking like, what are the frameworks that I use? Because when it comes down to it, it's, it's developing frameworks and how can I teach this, you know, so that the everyday consumer can understand it. Um, and I can see that being super powerful, you know, because then the next time you actually go and see a patient as well, you're like, oh, I already know my framework. I got this down. It's so weird. Right? It's a, a really <laughs> weird experience. Like to, It was really informative to go through and think about my own processes and honestly to put them down and write about them because it is so strange when someone comes in now. Almost what happens because I spent two years doing this in the book, snapshots of the book come into my head of different programs. And it's almost mm -hmm. like the book is, it's weird to have those visual snapshots when I work with people now. It's an interesting thing. It really is neat to think through your system and uh, to think through it, you know, that closely and kind of map it out. And then would you say that this is, sounds like it's a combination because a lot of what you're saying is very heavily research-based, but then there's got to be some of the art of your own anecdotal experience as well, right? Yeah, for sure. I think that's so important to have both, you know, I, of course, 
I want to be in the research. And I think that's a lot of the value of social media. I'm connected to a lot of PTs. And I love that because people are posting about research. It helps keep me up to date. I'm seeing studies. Uh, A lot of my growth early on as a PT was in Facebook discussion groups with different PTs and learning about pain science and just staying up to date on research. So research very much informs what I'm doing, but so does years of clinical practice and kind of that art of just what are things, what are the patterns I've seen with real patients and that's actually helped them? So, because we know, I mean, research is great, but it's not the same as a a real person in front of you. So you got to merge the two together. And I think that's going to be really important for new, new grads uh, and then fitness professionals because, you know, the, the, the future of movement health is research and data based, which is great, but please understand that it has its limitations because when someone's moving in pain, yes, there are definitely biomechanical structures and influences, but it's very multifactorial. There's a lot of things that go into it that needs to be considered that just can never be fully inscribed into a specific research study. Yeah, it's a person in front of you. Like it's a person who you can know all that data and research and theory. And I was like this in the beginning. I would come in with my specific goals based on the person's diagnosis and their impairments. And this is what we need to focus on. And I lost sight of the person's preferences and goals and what mattered to them. And I think it took me quite a few years actually to be aware of that and come back to it and really make sure to ask people like, what are you hoping to get out of this? Like, why are you here? What are you hoping I can help you with? Because oftentimes that answer totally shifts where you go with your session. And I think in a lot of cases it matches up closely with what your goals were, but sometimes it doesn't. And you have to take the person into account. It's there's so much therapy in physical therapy and just that counseling building rapport. It's it, people you just, if you're a new grad, just make sure not to overlook that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So going back to the book, you know, I think you talked about that there was really two intended audience. And I think we've dove into how someone could use it themselves to potentially guide themselves. But I want to dive more into the movement professionals and how they could utilize this book and really kind of uh, teasing apart the difference between the medical professional being, you know, the, the, P, the physical therapist, athletic trainer, chiropractor. And then there's the fitness professionals as well. Um, and it kind of tell me, how do you think that all of these are these two between medical professionals and then fitness professionals could utilize this book? Yeah, I think uh, when it's a medical professional, you know, if it's a non-rehab person, somebody maybe doesn't have that rehab background, but they're in a medical field. Uh, I've had lots of doctors get the book and use it. I think it it serves as a really good um you know, a good, they might be similar in some ways to the fitness professional almost where it's like, maybe they're not really well versed in these specific therapeutic exercises. Like say somebody has a gluteal tendinopathy, they might be like, I don't know what exercises like the PTs would prescribe for gluteal tendinopathy. I think for those individuals, it can be a really good therapeutic exercise resource for kind of getting their patients or clients started. And, you know, also maybe informative in terms of, I need to refer out because I'm kind of in over my head here. Like I can look at this and see what the PT might do with this person, but this is a lot to take on. I just feel like I'm going to send this person, refer them over and let the PTs do it. You know, fitness professionals, fitness professionals play a huge role. They're always interacting with people in pain and injured. I was a trainer for a lot of years before going to PT school. It's uh, it's silly to think that they are going to refer every single person out who has a little, wakes up and has a little tweak in their back or something. Like it just... I think if somebody hasn't had a traumatic injury where you're worried about something being torn or something being seriously injured, there's a lot fitness professionals are and can manage. And if they can have a good background on pain and injury science and kind of think like you were talking about before, not scare people with what they tell them, like, but, but kind of encourage and have some knowledge and can reassure them that most things get better and have a resource that kind of gives them specific exercises that might be a little different than what they typically do with that client in a session. And maybe it gives them some tools to, okay, let's build these other movements in that, you know, I've got this resource. This is going to give me some ideas of some things we could add and we can back off on some of these things that are kind of triggering your symptoms and we'll have more of a little bit of a recovery day. Maybe we'll do these other movements that help target these tissues that I think might be involved. So it gives them a tool set. I think it'd be really useful in those people, again, who haven't had that 
worrisome, more worrisome kind of traumatic injury where they maybe should be referred out, but they've just got something nagging that just started hurting and or it's an old thing that flared up that they already know about. You know, it just, I think in both of those cases, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a therapeutic exercise. I think for everyone, it's basically a therapeutic exercise resource with clinical, my clinical background and experience seeing people and then the research mixed in. And I think people are going to use it to different levels, the medical and fitness professionals. It's going to be there if they have a challenging case or someone comes in with something and they just need some things to be able to give them. The PTs, I think for them, they're of course going to probably naturally dive a little deeper into these details because it's written by a PT. It's very, it has, a. it's, it, you know, of course it has my PT sort of mindset. So it's, I think those are going to be the, you know, if I was a new grad PT, this would have been a book I would have, there, was, there wasn't like a good therapeutic exercise book. I don't feel like when I came out of school and so I think this book helps fill that need and is going to be a huge, helpful resource for um, those newer PTs and chiros who are, are those specific rehab people. <laughs> I think that was one of the things that blew my mind the most about hearing about different physical therapy curriculums and how much they lacked therapeutic exercise education. And I was like blown away by that. Um, but the truth is, is that in PT school, you really learn the foundations of movement and then you take that foundation and then you can apply it to any exercise, right? Um, but the book like this is is where you can go and say, okay, here is exactly how I apply it. And it really bridges that gap. Um, but I wanna I wanna go back to, you know, let's 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 play a role. Say, say if I am a new personal trainer, I just got my certification, I don't have a ton of training experience, but uh, I have a client that comes into me and says that they just started recently experiencing back pain. What should they be asking themselves? What should they be asking their clients? Uh, and like, should they try to guide it themselves or progress to a PT? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you were a fitness professional in that situation, probably similar to what I would do just as a PT. I think there's just some basic kind of things you can almost think about as like a screening on whether or not that person's appropriate to go forward with or not. And, you know, just like how long has this lasted? Is it getting better over time. Did you have an injury? Like, was there some kind of like, you know, the person got in a car wreck and it's been going on for a couple of months and it's getting, staying the wor same or getting worse over time. Well, that's probably a good person to refer out. But if it's like this started yesterday and I woke up, got out of bed, I think maybe I slept funny and my back feels sort of like tweaked, but I didn't have an injury. And I don't have any other kind of sinister symptoms like we talk about red flags, right? In PT, and these are all covered in the book. Like, is the person having like, you know, there's a lot of times it's like clusters of symptoms that can go together that when you see patterns of them, you're like, okay, I'm, maybe there's something else going on here in a, from a systemic standpoint that needs to be checked out. Like they're over 50, they have a history of cancer, they have pain that's uh, all the time, not even triggered by mechanical things. It's always there. It's there at night. You know, they have weird kind of numbness, tingling, like kind of symptoms, you know, just things that don't seem, I think you're just trying to figure out, does this seem like it's mechanical and part of their musculoskeletal system? And if it mm -hmm. in any way seems like it's not, then just send them somewhere else. Or if it seems like it's part of their musculoskeletal system, but it's like serious, like they had a car accident or they fell and now they've got like my knees buckling and feels like, yeah, well then send them to a rehab provider. But I think outside of those things, there's a lot you can do a lot you can learn um, and use from a therapeutic exercise standpoint to like there are exercises you could implement to just you know if you had that back pain person if you kind of clear all those things there's a lot you can do from just kind of like easy um, sort of more unloaded mobility soft tissue mobilizations different stretches a lot of trainers who have been around for a while know this like you know there's a lot you can do if you just had that person come in who kind of tweaked their back most trainers who have some experience are going to be like, okay, well, maybe we take a break from our deadlifts and heavy squats today and we'll have more of a recovery kind of healing focused day. We'll have some mobility stuff, maybe some soft tissue kind of work, you know? So I think this is a book that because it has those three phases, if you don't have any experience and you're a new trainer, this can kind of help guide you through. You can go to the low back pain program and be like, okay, I'm just going to start implementing these things and just see if I can help that person get out of some pain. Uh, and that's where I think it's so, so cool. I think that as a as a fitness professional, you'd be very quickly to be like, oh, you have shoulder pain? Okay, let me look at the exercises that are helpful for shoulder pain. Whereas I would say, take a step back and the first thing that you should look at in the book is the red flags, right? 
is, you know, that should be the first chapter that you should really review and just become aware of. It's not your, it's not your responsibility to diagnose anything like that. But if you can pick up on one of those red flags that might referral, right, might warrant a referral, you could be saving someone's life or you could be saving them a ton of money on their medical insurance. And then that's where I think that fitness professionals are really positioned in a huge point, knowing that musculoskeletal health is one of the major costs that put on the Medicare system. Right. If we can kind of educate and empower them in that way, I think that the benefit and the impact is incredible. Yeah. Fitness professionals, a lot of cases are the entry level. Are they the person that the uh, somebody who's coming in and entering kind of the movement kind of system that the, the trainers or the string coach is the first person they're interacting with? So I agree with you. Like if you're going to know anything, just know about some of the red flag symptoms. I just had somebody the other day come in with what seemed like a calf strain. Uh, probably a female in her 20s or 30s, seemed like a calf strain. I'm kind of going through her history doesn't quite match up. It's like inner calf. It's like, oh, it seems like it's right in the muscle belly, you know, but she didn't really have a history. Like she had been exercising, but no, nothing traumatic or anything she noticed where it hurt right away. And I mean, as we got into it more, we, I referred her out. She had a blood clot from birth control medication. Mm -hmm. And so it it was kind of warm to the touch and looked a little bit swollen she had a blood clot. Like it was just, it's so important to know some of those red flag symptoms. Like this, something makes you, doesn't look totally mechanical and looks a little suspicious. You want to know that stuff so you can send them out. You'll really help them in the long run. Oh man, absolutely. And when it comes down to it, if there's any one key takeaway is, can the pain be consistently reproduced with movement? Yep. Right. Yep. And if it can't, that is one of the first main triggers that I'm thinking in my head, like, okay, what else could be going on? Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and uh, and that's where you are trained to do that and uh, and to and to refer her out and once again potentially saving her life, preventing that from becoming a PE and you know blocking her lungs. So you know like things like that can be so cool. And how cool would it be if someone could utilize and learn these things in the book at the fitness professional and then do the same thing? Yep. Yeah, I used to for years. I taught for a group. Um, it was a. Uh, well, I taught two classes. Um, and one was for. Uh, rehab professionals. So I taught PTs. The other one was a different class. It was for fitness professionals. And okay. I think um, what I came away from all those years with was that a lot of fitness professionals know a ton of exercises, but they don't always know what things to look out for from a kind of injury pain standpoint and when to prescribe those exercises. And I think if you're a fitness professional, I, I taught for that group for six years. I really think a book like this, if you feel like, because you will probably look at a lot of these, uh, the fitness professional will probably look at the programs and be like, I know all a lot of these exercises, but this helps me understand when to actually prescribe them. So and I think that's the big thing I noticed from all those years of teaching individuals in that space. It's like they knew a lot of these exercises, but they didn't always know how to order them or which one should I give the person based on this pain they're having. Yeah, yeah. I think this is something that like really excites me about like kind of the field of resources like this book, um, how like motion captures coming out for them, dynamometers, things like that, that's going to allow physical therapists, but also tr- fitness trainers be more informed when they're assessing someone and then to really make appropriate suggestions for them. Um, and I think it's so cool. And to have such a breadth of knowledge in that book is is really incredible. So I, I can't thank you enough for, for providing that resource for them. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's been amazing to get it out there and see it helping people. Just seeing people it, travel around the world and people using it. I Sometimes people send me DMs on Instagram, like of them at their Pilates studio, like looking through it and using it. And it's there as a resource. That's what it was meant for that practitioner or again, just the regular person. So it's really neat to see that happening. That is amazing. That is amazing. So you're here. You're now very successful. I've reached millions and millions of people online. You're now a published author, which I saw was working its way up the list there uh, and, and continuing to grow. Um, but you know, like, what's on your horizon? What do you what What's in the future for Dr. Walters? Yeah, I'm actually really excited about this coming year. So uh, probably the first thing that I'm working on right now is that we're taking uh, all the programs from the big book and uh, publishing eight small books for each body region. So some people might just want like a little soft cover. Like I just want back programs, or I just want shoulder programs. I don't want this textbook to like cover, carry around everywhere. So that'll be the first thing we're going to do is just create body region specific kind of smaller books for people that just want one body region, uh, which will be cheaper because there are, even though the book is, you know, discounted now and it's like 33 bucks on Amazon, some people still, especially in other countries, a currency exchange that can still be expensive. So 
having things that are a little bit less expensive that are just that body region, that those will come out next October. And then the other thing I'm really excited about is I'm going to start uh, online courses for movement medical practitioners next year that will be uh, a lot of video-based things, um, will include a lot of therapeutic exercise prescription like the book does, but will also include manual therapy courses and assessment-based courses. So like that fitness professional that wants to know what are some like quick kind of movement screens or tests I could do to see if this person has like a rotator cuff injury maybe, or kind of can I differentiate between some of these things? We know special tests aren't always that special, but like, what are some things I can kind of do to screen someone? Is this like purely mechanical? Can I learn a test that I can try on the person right now and see if it reproduces their symptoms and help guide me in, okay, this, it does seem mechanical or this doesn't seem mechanical. And then what are some, you know, and then the manual therapy courses, you know, will probably be more for depending on how they're organized, you know, maybe some will be um, more focused on kind of soft tissue techniques and anybody can take them. There might be some that are mobilization manipulation included. Maybe that's like a rehab practitioner who, you know, because, you know, licenses and things prevent some people from doing things. But that's what I, I really am excited about all those courses next year. It'll be kind of like a rehab science university in a way that has all these different courses. You know, the book was for the everyday person and the practitioner, the trainer, all that. The courses will really just be for the practitioners. Okay. Okay. So they're only going to be for like the medical professionals or will there also be some for the fitness professionals as well? It'll be both. Yeah. It'll be kind of, it'll be really mostly anyone in that spectrum, like medical rehab fitness. So I'm going to gear them okay. so that, because they will be therapeutic exercise focused. Um, so they'll still be, they'll cross kind of that, that spectrum of all those different professionals. If I, if anything is specific to just a rehab person, it might be like a specific manual therapy course with mobilization, manipulation, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. Well, I will definitely, I will definitely be signing up for all of those because I'm excited to check that out. Because um, you know, always, always got to be learning and, and enhancing your craft, and so and to learn from someone that that has done such a good job of not only like thoroughly educating yourself, but then finding ways to explain it so it's digestible and you can understand it so it actually leads lasting impact i mean it's an incredible skill set that you've developed and you know <laughs> really appreciate you for that oh yeah man no i i honestly i love it it's uh i'm so grateful for it every day i'm just grateful for the platforms and to be able to really like positively influence people and teach them about pain and injury in their movement system so yeah i um thank you for saying all that i'm really grateful for it yeah of course of course so just you know before we go where if someone does want to get the book, where what's the best place to get it? You know, Amazon is always usually the cheapest option. So it's called Rehab Science, How to Overcome Pain and Heal from Injury. It's a big red book. Uh, Amazon, but you can get it at Barnes & Noble, um, Target, uh, people who are located internationally. There's a bookstore in the UK called Blackwell's that, you know, you could... But usually in terms of like price and shipping, Amazon is the best. And I've talked to a lot of people around the world. It's still, even with shipping being expensive, the book is cheaper on Amazon. So it's usually the best option. Oh, wow. Amazing. That sounds good. And then is there any like, you know, last things that you'd like to include or say that to, to maybe the therapist, the fitness professional, or maybe just the person that's in pain and, and kind of any ending thoughts? Yeah. I think the one that I always come back to is that, you know, it's always a little tricky because I'm, my account's called rehab science and I'm a physical therapist. People a lot of times have the misconception that, these exercises that we prescribe uh, in physical therapy, people often think of them as only being useful when they have pain or an injury. And I think it's so key for people to know that all of these strategies are things that I often incorporate in the gym just to keep healthy. So if you think about like the book and the programs, the phase one exercise, it's the soft tissue mobilizations. A lot of times those can be useful for just kind of getting something warmed up maybe you have a little bit of discomfort that you wouldn't really call a pain, but it's a way to kind of loosen things up. The phase two and phase three exercises, all the mobility, motor control and strength exercises, those are just great things to implement on a somewhat regular basis. Maybe you mix them into your normal training program. You, you cherry pick some from each body region. You mix them. Maybe I'm going to do a rotator cuff exercise here. I got to make sure I get these different calf races to keep my Achilles tendon and my calf strong. You know, maybe I'm going to incorporate a low back exercise for my low back extensors. You don't have to have pain or injury for these to help your movement system. So rehab exercises are also prehab exercises. They help keep you healthy and reduce the risk of injury. So I think 
that's a misconception I think a lot of people have about uh, physical therapy and these kind of more specific therapeutic exercises. But I'm always trying to kind of educate and push back on that. They help you even when you're not injured or having pain. <laughs> One of the main things I have to say to my patients is, you know, when you're done, they're like, we'll have to continue to do them. And I say, yeah, like you, you will have to continue to do them, but keep them in your back pocket. They shouldn't be the only things that you're doing. You should do find the, the movements that you find joy in that you're going to be able to do on a consistent and sustainable basis, but making sure you're not neglecting it and incorporating this in throughout your program. And I think that these are the things that really set people up for success. Amen to that. That's it was yeah. so well stated. Like you got to find the things like at the end of the day, exercise and movement, having a regular practice is the most important thing. So find the thing that you enjoy. It's not like I just go to the gym and do rehab exercises. I just spend core you in there, you know, once in a while. So I do all the, I do my things that I really like, but once in a while I'll add something in and just keep those tissues healthy. So yeah, I think that was well stated. I love it. I love it. Well, Hey, Dr. Talm, I really appreciate you. Like your time is so valuable. And I know that anyone that's there listening or watching this is going to gain a ton of value from it. Um, so if you haven't, if you're interested in the book, make sure to go to Amazon, type in rehab science. Uh, if, vid- if you're looking at a video, it looks like this. I think you have it in your back. Well, I dip, hiding behind me. Uh, I got it right here. I keep it with me at all times. It looks like this guy here. Oh, where is it? There we go. Um, but amazing, man. I appreciate you. And, uh, I hope you have a wonderful time and let's keep those sales coming in. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks again for having me, man. I hope this is helpful to your audience and I'll talk to you soon.